Hey. Hey, welcome. It's great to see uh, so many people here today, in particular because where COGX is talking about lots of diverse things that are really important, this one is certainly the most important, and I think that's probably what brought you here. At the rest of COGX, we celebrate AI in the way that it can actually solve some of our greatest problems as a society, unlock some of the mysteries of science, improve healthcare, improve criminal justice, make our societies run, lower the carbon emissions that we have. But we all sort of know that inside of ourselves that we sort of botched technology 1.0, the great era of the computing in which we had the bit and we had the processor and then we had the internet and we botched it because we had to sprinkle security on top of what we'd already built. We didn't actually bake it in from the outset. And we hope that as we're at the dawn or the outset of this new revival of AI with deep learning and all these other techniques, that we can actually do better and think about it a lot more strategically by building security in at the outset. But even if we can't, because we're stuck with our legacy systems, the important thing is that all is not lost. Where AI giveth, AI can also taketh away. The bad guys are using this technology to undermine what the good guys are building. So what we have today are three of the good guys coming in, women as well, guys in sort of a neutral sense, uh, people coming in who are basically able to say, if this is the world that we have and there's going to be bad actors in it, what can good actors do to protect the rest of us? So we've got three remarkable speakers today. We've got Dave from Dark Trace, we've got Robert from BT, and we've got um, uh, 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 Grace Casey from Cylon, which isn't a company per se, but is an accelerator both in London and Singapore, working in cybersecurity. We're going to hear three keynotes of about 10 minutes each, and then I'm going to bring them on stage, I'm going to interrogate them like a journalist will interrogate them, and then I'm going to cut myself off atypically, early, so that you can interrogate them. And with that, I'm going to bring Dave from Darktrace, Dave Palmer from Darktrace, onto the stage. Thanks, Dave. Great. Cheers. Yeah. Hello, good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm going to start talking about how we expect some of the threats to evolve, um, and we'll try and shout over the, uh, the, the building noise. Uh, the way I'm going to tackle this is essentially what's happening now, how is it changing, and how are we realistically expecting AI to factor into changing attacks? I'm not talking about defenses at all um, for this part. And the first thing to say in the state of where we are now is uh, you're all using terrible passwords, almost certainly. Um, this is how long it takes using a common encryption algorithm to attack your password. And I can say relatively boldly that most of you are going to be up at this end of the time scale, not at this end, um, unless you're particularly diligent on passwords. And this really matters. Um, you know, as it becomes completely commodity to guess what your passwords are in different environments, then not only are you putting yourselves at risk, but there's a general hygiene problem for everyone else. But even if we were using the best perfect uh, algorithm to uh, encryption algorithm to protect our passwords, completely foolproof, well, there are only 5.8 quadrillion permutations of an eight-character password, and. Uh, any of us at home spending a relatively moderate amount of money on a, on a laptop, et cetera, could expect to brute force every uh, eight-character password in the world within about five days. Um, and, and that's not great. And of course, th this is without supercomputer arrays or exotic quantum computing. And these numbers, of course, are only trending in one direction. So if you take nothing else from my remarks or any cybersecurity conversation ever for the rest of your life, please head this way and, and not that way. And unfortunately, there's more bad news for passwords. Uh, and that's that other people lose them for you. So um, if you're tired of hearing about data breaches, don't worry, everyone else is too, so they don't really hit the, the news anymore. Even ones that were big in our news scene, like the British Airways breach, is only a tiny blob on here, and they're absolutely happening all of the time. And uh, all of these breaches will involve personal information, information about you um, and your life, and most of them tend to involve passwords, either passwords that are completely unencrypted or passwords that are easily attackable, as we saw on the last stage. And if you're... Um, 
thinking, well, it doesn't matter if the occasional um, hacker in a basement somewhere gets hold of my passwords. Um, there's only a few of them in the basement. What harm can they do? Well, the sad truth is that there is a massive sharing economy when it comes to stolen passwords. And uh, it gets shared on the internet and the dark web routinely. And of course, if it's on the internet, someone is going to index it for you. And so companies like this uh, exist. This is from Securio, where you can go and look up how much uh, trouble you're in. This is all the Dave Palmers in the world who have uh, lost, well, it's not, uh, not by any stretch, all of them. Uh, some of the Dave Palmers in the world who have lost uh, accounts and passwords. I am in this list uh, on that screen. Um, and unfortunately, there are an awful lot of these going around. It's completely commodity now to look someone up and gain access to their passwords. And these passwords are pretty dreadful. Um, these are all passwords from Dave Palmer's around the world, including me. Um, I'm not going to tell you which one's mine. Uh, and as you look at this list, you can see they're, they're pretty awful, aren't they? Hannah, Palmer 12, well done, Palmer 9, Palmer 1. Um, turns out Dave Palmer's are pretty bad at guessing, setting their passwords. If you're looking at number 63 and you think, this looks like a great password, well, it turns out that's just a different computer representation of Jackson 5 that is also in the list. And someone's charted out their entire relationship status. A Dave somewhere in the world has been with Kathy and then... Uh, <laughs> on the plus side, at least it got longer. Um, so, so these aren't great. And what, why am I talking about this at an AI conference? Well, there are 1.4 trillion passwords and personally identified information, all in structured data fields that just Securio, who are uh, the company that um, provided that service we saw on the last slide, have seen on their own. So ignoring everyone else that's collecting up passwords that the bad guys are sharing around, one company has got more than 1.4 trillion structured records. And we can see these come in clumps. There are sports cars. There are uh, partners' names. There are... Um, sports teams. There, there are clearly cultural norms and clusters in the way that Dave Palmer's around the world set their password. And this is a representative set. I haven't fiddled with this to make it look worse than it is. Uh, all I've done is try and take um, duplication out of this list. And all of you who are interested in AI, this is not being thought about really in the security community, but in the AI community, you will recognize this is an amazing training set to start creating systems where from an email address or even just from someone's name, you would be able to start creating predictions about the likely passwords that they have. And now you don't have to search 5.8 quadrillion different records to see if that password is your target. You can probably interact with a relatively simple to build system and have it give you a list of the passwords that likely exist. So I think there's a storm brewing there. And if you're thinking, hey, I'm a, um, am I clicking this wrong? Ah, thanks. Um, if you're thinking, well, you know, I'm, I work in innovation, or I'm a thought leader, or something like that, why does it matter? I haven't got any data, data worth stealing in my organization. Well, this is an example of a criminal getting a foothold in just one laptop, and within less than 59 seconds, that laptop has been used as a bridge to infect every other uh, computer in the entire organization. And this is an agricultural firm. We go from one laptop to everybody else's laptops, a bunch of servers, and even through to the manufacturing floor. 59 seconds, way faster than human beings can expect to react. And this is a mid-sized firm here in the UK, but it happens to mass-scale firms as well. If you're familiar with Maersk and the, some of the stories that, of trouble that they had the year before last, they lost 45,000 laptops and 4,000 servers, absolutely everything in their digital business, in the 14 minutes it took their head of security, Andy, to go from a meeting back to the office. 14 minutes, game over, no more Maersk, back to pen and paper. And the point here is, Criminals don't sneak around anymore. They kick the door in and they go wild. But what we have here is a systemic weakness that is identical across the whole of the business. There's no AI in that attack or the Maersk one. But what we should reasonably expect 
is um, AI modules that get put into these self-spreading worms where they treat their activity of spreading around the network like a game of chess. What is the maximum control I can exert in a single move? How can I strategically outpace the defenders and what they're trying to achieve? And how do I trade off detectability versus speed versus impact? Um, this notion of overwhelming human defenders before they can react is amazingly successful, but you will need smarter systems as defenses keep improving. Consumers are suffering differently, um, but also in kind of similar ways. If someone gets into your email because they've got a bad password, I've been helping a, a young lady recently who um, someone got access to email, they immediately reset the password on her EE phone, mobile phone provider. Once they got access to the mobile pho phone provider account, they ported her mobile phone number to a handset in the criminal's control and then went nuts. They took her Uber Eats account, her Amazon account, her uh, Airbnb account, John Lewis account, strangely. I wouldn't have thought you could conduct much crime with a John Lewis account, but there you go. Um, and then finally, to make sure her uh, life was a total digital misery, they took all of the money out of her NatWest bank account and then went after uh, and reset her Apple account as well. Where do you begin when you've lost every piece of digital identity in your life. You don't have your bank account anymore, your mobile phone number, or your email account. You are pretty stuffed. Now, this is happening at the moment with human beings, but it takes about an hour, and you have to pay those human beings. So it's absolutely certain to me that we will see um, semantic processing being used for uh, uh, AI systems doing this within a minute or two of gaining access to someone's email account because you've guessed their password or found it, then uh, game over for that account. Obviously a lot better if you've got two-factor authentication, but that only gets you so far. I am enormously running out of time, so I'll cover a couple of things very briefly. Um, even if your passwords are great, other people in your life will become a vulnerability. Azim and I have been emailing each other about this event today. We can reasonably expect systems, instead of involving human beings faking emails from Azeem's inbox, that if someone gets onto Azeem's laptop, an AI system could automatically recognize we have a shared diary appointment, we have some shared communications, and um, shoot me an email that sounds like Azeem, that's roughly his communication style, um, and is um, contextual enough that I will just click on it. So these are the things that are to me, relatively obvious um, evolutions of what AI is going to bring into the environment. I think we will see these in the near future because they make criminal activities uh, much more profitable per victim. They allow you to hit a lot more victims at once. And crucially, the less human beings you've got in your criminal enterprise, the less likely that the FBI is going to uh, flip one of them and get them to snitch on you or someone does something stupid that uh, it means that you get caught. Uh, with that, thank you very much. I'm going to skip through the rest of these. Fantastic. That scares me so much. I was actually emailing my wife to do something password related um, because actually I'm terrified in, down to my socks. Um, now what I'd like to do is bring up to the stage Robert, Robert Hercock of uh, BT to tell us about uh, what he and the organization is doing beyond telecoms. Go for it, Robert, thanks. Awesome. Right, are you all awake? Are you happy? You won't be soon, don't worry. <laughs> right, so that's me. Um, I like to go back in time a little bit. So. People think of AI and cyber as very new processes. In actual fact, this all began literally back in the 1940s. So we just had the D-Day sets of anniversary. This is Colossus Mark II. So you know, state of the art. I know it looks primitive, but really state of the art. And this is what's interesting. Cybersecurity and AI and computing all began at that, that same time, the same genesis point. Turing, uh, in this case, Tommy Flowers designed this machine. We're all working on the same set of problems. And the two fields then kind of diverged. So cyber went one way, you know, we hold the encryption piece, AI and its sort of uh, evolution went another way. We're now seeing these two fields come back again. 
this is what matters. So my takeaway for the day is people think of security AI as different domains. They're now they're not. They're, they're both sort of on a parallel track and increasingly going to intersect with each other. So the good news is, so BT think of, people think of BT as a broadband provider. We are also a global network player and we have about 3,000 people globally working on cybersecurity and it's a 24 seven job, as Dave was just saying, to protect everyone. Um, it doesn't, the bad guys don't sleep. They, they drink a lot of Red Bull. <laughs> Um, so it's a 24-hour uh, problem, and also it's massively increasing. It's just, it scares me how fast it's increasing, okay? Um, hundreds of thousands of new malware samples, millions of malicious e uh, new email attacks per month. You know, you can read the numbers, it's huge. Um, and that's another key point. So one of the, so in my research team, we're looking at how we can use AI machine learning to defend networks, to defend everyone because we have to automate the process to a degree. Um, also come on to how far you want to automate that process. That's another question. Similarly, this is a, sort of a quick slide deck of where we are. So one of the biggest ISPs, global enterprise, I said over 3,000 people, just, just in security, just in cybersecurity. Terabytes of data per second. Um, I don't know about you, I can't read a terabyte a second. Um, it, you know, it just blurs, it's very hard. Um, So what are the risks that we're facing? We're facing every kind of risk. So hacktivism, moderate level risk, you know, people get annoyed with some major company, some you know, animal rights process, whatever it is. Uh, criminal risk high, as Dave was just saying. This is big business. This is professional business. You can go online to the dark web. You can you know, pay $10, get a DDoS attack on somebody you don't like. Don't, please, don't do that. Um, Terrorism risk, that's an interesting one. Risk actually moderate. Um, that's, an, that's interesting because people you think of as being very malicious. For them, this, the cyber domain is a tool. It's a recruitment agency. It's a you know, money laundering process. But it's not for them, it's not core business. Whereas for the criminals, it's core business. You know, it's how you make a living. It's a different, so intent matters in terms of the threat level. Nation state risks, now very high. So most nation states, use cyber increasingly as a you know, influencing process, as a political process, as a way of shaping other countries' uh, activity with you. Um, increasingly we're seeing that. An insider threat, of course. Insider threat is a complicated one. The risk can be very high, and it depends who, which conference you go to in terms of how frequently you think that happens. Dave mentioned MERS, the shipping company. So one of the biggest attacks a couple of years ago, 2017, was not Petya. So this was an attack, basically, Russia attacked the Ukraine using a cyber weapon they stolen from America. Um, and many companies got hit for hundreds of millions of dollars. The total cost was about $10 billion. This was not small change. The interesting one was, was Merce, the shipping company, for this reason. It had a huge impact on the physical world. This was not bits and bytes. Thousands of container ships were stuck in ports because they couldn't unload. The sh computers that would un control the unloading process had no data. They didn't know where the container's supposed to go. You can't unload this if you don't know where the container's supposed to go. Yeah? And so you had ships backed up. You had convoys of lorries backed up into ports. Mers controls like a third of the world's shipping. Yeah? This has a huge critical infrastructure impact. Um, so it's just to sort of embed that you know, losing your you know, digital identity in your phone is annoying. Um, not being able to supply your country with resources is very annoying. So what are we doing about it? So I lead a research team in BT where basically we're trying to combine AI and visualization, data analytics. So we do, we do a lot of visualization of the data. So personally, I'm a big believer in that human beings are not so great at calculus, usually, um, but we are very good at visual processing. The thing inside your head evolved to be a visual processing system. That's what it evolved to be. You are all superb at color recognition, pattern recognition. You can see the texture of this building. You are brilliant visual engineering systems, okay? So let's translate the data into something the human being can process. So the point of the, this tool is that to give our security analysts a way of hoovering up the data, that we use the AI to classify everything. That's what these are, colored blobs are here, where the AI is trying to classify, categorize all the massive flows of data, gigabytes of data per second, and give the analyst because you only have a, have a small number of analysts. You never have enough security analysts. Um, 
If you want a job, by the way, see me afterwards, <laughs> if you have any skills. Um, and this is a, a more boring technical deck, but it just illustrates that we're using a whole full range of AI machine learning tools, in this case, deep learning. So um, for many years, we've used standard machine learning, statistical methods, Bayesian methods, things like that, like spam filtering. Increasingly now, we're looking at things like vector embedding, convolutional neural networks, reinforcement learning, in this case, to identify botnet attacks, the little colored squares where the tool's learning. These, this activity in the network is, looks odd. Um, yes, you can get false positives. Yeah, no, it's not perfect. Um, it's a continuous research process, and we try and push the, you know, our research outputs into the business. Um, here's the next slide deck. Um, then another tool we've been working on is something called Nexus. So a nice thing is that you can uh, apply graph theory to a lot of mo uh, data processes. So you can think of like whether it's a social graph, an IP network, a supply network, a lot of uh, data systems can be modeled as a set of node and edges. And then you can actually apply quite sophisticated visualization tools. And we built this in-house. This is our own tool. We've developed it in our research team. And just lets the analysts explore large-scale data sets. It makes pretty pictures as well, which is nice. What was useful about this, we designed this tool originally to do both supply chain and IP traffic, when we thought, just a minute, um, this is identifying a botnet in the system. This is a general purpose graph engine, so you can actually apply it to a wide range of applications. And one of the ones that relates to the massive increase in ransomware activity going on at the moment is Bitcoin. So this is actually Bitcoin data. So this is transactions in the blockchain underlying Bitcoin. So the preferred criminal payment method is Bitcoin. So if you hack someone, you do ransomware, you want Bitcoin payments. So in that case, we're drilling into exploring the Bitcoin payments graph. And in th this case, these sort of three blobs down here are the malicious wallets from the WannaCry attack. So when WannaCry hit uh, two years ago, those are the actual wallets in, the in that uh, Bitcoin network where the criminals were taking payments. Um, interesting, there was this about $300,000 sat in those wallets. Don't act try and access it. <laughs> It's, it's uh, not a good idea. But the, t the tool like this lets you explore and interact with this big data set. And this is another point. So security, cybersecurity increasingly is, is a big data problem. You're looking for a weak signal in a vast amount of data. So it's how can you accelerate that process and help the end user, the analyst or whoever the, your engineers are, ex fix the problem. We're also called the craning group by the other people in our labs were quite jealous of our coloring skills. <laughs> right. Going towards my sort of summary, I think this is the key point. As Dave was saying, we're not really seeing the bad guys using advanced AI yet. That's not happening. I think it's going to, ha going to happen. Excuse the audio hacking going on at the moment. <laughs> so we're inc I think within the next two, three years, we will see AI, and especially deep fakes, the whole deep fake process being used for malicious purposes. Um, in this case, identity. We're going to see AI itself become more diverse, become more heterogeneous. It will start to mirror the cultures and the societies that are generating it. it won't, we won't just have a vanilla AI. There'll be a global uh, variety of different kinds of AI with different norms, different behaviors, different attitudes, different responses to how it interacts with human beings. And all of those will be used for malicious purposes. And then th this is the point we're going to get to. H who's behind the mask? Is there anybody behind the mask? When you're dealing with something online or something's doing a, an interaction with you, how will you know what it is that you're dealing with? Is it human? A mix of human and machines or just a machine? Um, and that's critical for security because identity is the crux of security. You can't have security without identity. Who is this actor? It, does this actor have the right to do the thing they want to do? Um, I don't see an easy solution to this. This is very much a research problem. Um, identifying and stopping you know, deep fakes, deep videos that are being used for malicious purposes is going to be a horrendous problem. Um, and even more so in its text, like the OpenAI tool that was discussed recently. Um, how do you detect when something, an email coming in, is a spear phishing email, and the, these days they tend to, you, there's always some kind of giveaway, some clue that it's not what it's supposed to be. And if you're awake and you've had lots of coffee, you spot it. Um, however, when that email's been crafted by an AI in a very refined way, knowing everything about you, it will be a horrendous problem. Um, that's something we're going to have to face. 
So, conscious of time. So deep learning is fantastic, great tool, amazing tool, but it's going to accelerate both defensive and offensive cybersecurity processes. So we are using it for defense. That's fantastic. It accelerates our ability of the analyst to go through large amounts of data. But the bad guys are going to wake up quite soon to the potential of it. That they and for them, it's just a business process like anything else. Um, then we get into sort of a cultural dialogue about you know, what's malicious. Um, depends who you are. The next question that usually comes up in conferences is, is how autonomous should the defending AI be? Because the question says, Robert, can't you just take the humans out of the loop? If you watch war games, yeah, let's take the humans out of the loop. We'll just automate the whole process. You can do that, yeah? But, but please don't. <laughs> because the first thing the bad guys will do is say, aha, you have a fully automated AI defense system. I will now spoof you and force that AI to overreact yeah? and cause an autoimmune disease whereby you shut down your own system. Yeah? Um, it's the first thing the bad guy's going to do. Well, it's the first thing I'd do I mean, if I was attacking somebody. Um, Ken made the mistake of saying there are three good guys turning up today. There are, there are, there are two good guys that are over there. <laughs> um, actually, there's, there's a caveat on that one even. I think within five years, you'll get to the point where you can't have the human in the loop. As Dave was saying, the speed and volume could rapidly get to the point where you have to fully automate. And that's going to be a fascinating world in which the AI is defending against attacking AI. Um, yeah. Make sure you have a very long password. Okay? You want like a 40 character password. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. Um, and the final point is explainable AI. Current neural, uh, deep learning systems tend to be very much black boxes, very hard to inference what they, why they reach the decision. And if in the security domain, that's no good. You need to know why something was done. Why was the decision taken? You need to be able to trust that decision. And this is very much an open research question in the security community. How are we going to get a, a, a more transparent inferencing mechanism that we can rely on and explain that to the, the stakeholders, business community, this is why the, the, the defending system took this decision? Yeah? Um, and on the, you know, the, that decision to shut down a particular subnetwork was a valid decision and wasn't something that was being spoofed or maliciously driven. Okay, are you still happy? But you're not worried enough then. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot, right, yep. Okay, thanks a lot, Ken. Hey. Thank you very much. Okay, so who here, that's a great question to end on. Who here is happy? Raise your hand. Have you not been listening? Who here is terrified? Raise your hand. Raise two if you're really scared. Come on. Like, I'm literally telling my wife, change the passwords. Okay. Grace Casey of Ceylon, take it away. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Um, so very briefly uh, on Ceylon, uh, we are a startup program that finds, grows, and invests in some of the world's most exciting emerging startups in this space. And we've been doing this for just over four years. And in that time, we've assessed about 1,000 applications from startups across a whole range of this very diverse field. And as you can see, about just under 10% of those applicants have actually made the cut to join our programs in London and Singapore. And you know, rather than kind of add to the level of depression here today, I thought what I might do is try to talk a little bit about some of the themes we've seen emerging from the innovators that we work with and give you a bit of hope that there are people working on some really interesting solutions to some of the, the issues that Dave and Robert have, have identified. So from those 1,000 applications, obviously there's a, a huge number of uh, themes that one could pick out. But given that I have less than 10 minutes, I'm just going to pick out a few indicative areas. And the first of those that I would dwell on is the continuing uh, importance, the prevalence of human factors in cybersecurity, and that manifests itself in two key ways, fallibility and focus. So first, fallibility. Still the case that humans are really responsible for the majority of breaches that we see uh, happening now. In fact, I think research shows about 88% of all breaches originate from a human problem. 
Much of this is really basic stuff. Re, you know, as David said, having poor passwords in the first place, reusing those passwords, misaddressing your emails, and then perhaps at, earlier on in the process, developers writing code that contains mistakes and then gets built into a product and lies dormant until a criminal can find and exploit it. And then there's phishing. And evolution has made us all surprisingly susceptible to a well-judged cat video. And that's before you even get to some of the more AI-powered, more sophisticated targeted attacks that, that Dave and Robert are, are talking about. You know, the really basic stuff still gets us. And any amount of awareness training, which is still the industry's default response to this, doesn't tend to stop people clicking on these links. Because it's pretty cute. Who doesn't want to click on that? So in a way, cyber criminals are really attacking human nature. But the scale and the rapid evolution of this problem also presents us with a massive opportunity. And we see some really interesting new approaches being developed and applied by startups that recognize that the answer here is not better and better firewalls, but it's trying to reduce the amount of human error in the first place. And often, that's with a judicious application of AI. Some examples in that space might be the use of machine learning to reduce the scope for user error. An example there might be a company like Tessian that's applying uh, AI to stop you sending emails to the wrong people by accident. Other examples are the application of psychology and behavioral economics to try to instill better security practice inside organizations. And much of that builds on uh, nudge theory and the other work of uh, people like the Nobel laureate Richard Thaler. And there's a number of really interesting companies in that space, like Immersive Labs, Outthink, both are on security, that are all trying to create a different way of addressing this challenge of awareness and training. Or it might be through creating better code in the first place, and there's numerous companies trying to help developers to build security in as they're developing their products in the first place. And also to check the open source components that many people are using to build their products without realizing that they already contain vulnerabilities. Now, this problem is not going to go away because we are human, after all. But we do start to see some real progress among innovators working on this human problem. The second area which I'd mention in terms of human issues is focus and the difficulty in finding it. Many people who work in the hard end of information security will tell you that their jobs feel a bit like this. They're walking into a pretty stiff headwind with too many threats, too many alerts, too many products, and not enough skilled people to help them prioritize and respond to incidents. And as we've heard, adversaries are getting better and more sophisticated all the time. One response to that is to throw more resource at the problem. You can try to hire more security people. You can even outsource your problems to a managed services provider. But the reality is that skilled security professionals are extremely hard to find, and managed security services are very expensive. So realistically, those are not solutions for most companies out there. And we see a lot of innovators helping to provide some focus in this challenging circumstance. And AI and automation is absolutely part of that response. See a huge number of startups around the world thinking of how to apply automation, AI, machine learning to aspects of this challenge of overload. From gathering and disseminating threat intelligence to monitoring a complex and highly permeable membrane around an organization to actually managing and responding to incidents. In all those cases, automation and AI can really help to distinguish signal from noise, allowing your highly skilled people to spend more time focusing on what really matters. Dave's company, Darktrace, is really in many ways the, the granddaddy of this approach in security. And there's any number of other examples of the trend towards automation and AI and security. Newcomers like Sotview and Sensian from our Cylon portfolio to bigger, more established players like Demisto, which, uh, to, just to illustrate this trend, was just bought a couple of weeks ago by Palo Alto Networks for half a billion dollars. What else do we see? Well, an awful lot, actually. Just to <laughs> underline, especially for any of you who are less familiar with this world of cybersecurity, it's a massive topic with almost limitless array of angles to it. So I'm just going to pick out two themes which are somewhat less headline-grabbing than some of the things that we've heard about already today, 
but I think nonetheless are fascinating signs of shifts in the way people are thinking about protecting themselves. The first of those is supply chain risk. This has shot to prominence in the last year as an increasing number of breaches, probably 60% or more, are shown to derive from third or fourth party risk. Techniques for managing this have traditionally been really manual, sending out surveys, managing spreadsheets, hiring an audit firm to help you manage it. But typically, you're just getting a snapshot, and you can't actually keep up with the pace of interconnectedness between companies or the range and pace of technological change. But the good news is that we see some really great companies emerging, which are applying techniques not dissimilar to the social networks to increase the visibility of suppliers and their contingent risks. And that's companies like CyberGRX, RiskLedger, and Interos, all of whom are really bringing this new, more sophisticated approach to mapping supply chain and risk. And if that wasn't already less exciting to you than nation-state threats and AI bots, I'm going to mention insurance. So do stay awake for this, because it's actually quite interesting. The evolution of cyber insurance is, is a real theme that we've observed in working with startups over the last couple of years. I think this is a result of people and companies accepting that you can no longer create a perfect defense. When it first appeared, cyber insurance was very much about transferring a risk, perhaps providing um, some financial security around physical assets. And frankly, it was and still to some extent is very challenging to price a cyber risk. But as insurers are spending more time working with innovators who are deploying these more sophisticated approaches we've heard about, cyber insurance now looks increasingly like an essential part of a risk management approach. So many policies will now offer you access to experienced incident management services, and many will actually focus on building resilience into your business practice in the first place, clearly to help you try to avoid the problem and to manage it better when it probably inevitably does happen to hit you. This kind of thing, I think, is particularly important for SMEs who have more fragile balance sheets and can't take advantage of some of the very sophisticated tools and expensive services that are out there. And finally, how does all of this translate into what we see people, users, and investors actually spending their money on? Well, there isn't much data out there about what ordinary citizens are using and spending money on in terms of security products. I think antivirus is pretty well used, well understood these days. But beyond that, my guess is that most people outside of the tech world are not yet using the next level of protection like a password manager or using a VPN to access the internet. So my personal plea to you today, on top of Dave's uh, request to you to extend your passwords is also to use a password manager. If you're not using one already, they're very simple and they make a big difference. Within the enterprise, there's obviously much more data available. The picture is constantly changing and as Forrester Research in fact describes it, chaos is the new normal. But even if it is chaotic, you can discern that security budgets are high and in most cases are rising with major areas of spend around cloud infrastructure, threat intelligence, and human risk. And interest in these innovative new approaches is underscored by what we've seen in the first two quarters of this year, which is a huge surge in cyber M&A activity. I already mentioned Demisto. We've seen a whole batch of big money acquisitions happening in this space in the last three months. Companies like Recorded Future, Webroot, Meta Networks, getting acquired often at big multiples on their earnings. Back at the startup end of the spectrum, we're seeing an increasingly active VC community here in Europe, and Europe absolutely is now starting to be seen as a leader in this space. Sequoia's investment recently in Tessian Series B is a great example of this trend. That's a very brief rush through. Look forward to discussing in more detail in the panel. Thanks, Grace. That's great. Grace, stay on stage. Join me in one of the three chairs over here. Let me bring Robert and uh, Dave onto stage as well. Uh, what I'd like to do is have a very quick set of questions with them, a lightning round, so I can allow you guys to ask questions. But first, <coughs> I want a show of hands. Who here is more scared after you've seen the presentations than you were when you walked in? Raise your hand if you're more scared. Okay, so that looks like 21.3% of you. 
who here is less scared now that you've seen the presentations? Who here is a little bit more relieved? <laughs> so yeah, two people, three people, optimists. Okay, I just want to point out that these guys were talking about solutions, and you're more scared. Okay, <laughs> let's just go with it. All right, guys, um, I want to get a, a sort of a yes or no, a one-word answer from you from the questions that I have right now. We're going to start with you, Grace. Are we winning the war or losing the war? Winning. Uh, stalemate. Losing. <laughs> this is great. What a great spread. And you're like, you're like the deviant stalemate. Okay. Um, so why winning? No, I'm not going to pretend that this is easy. Far from it. That's been made pretty clear today. But uh, you know, what we're doing is working with the really smart people who are trying to build the innovations to tackle this. And I think if you spend time with those people day in, day out, you can't help but be quite optimistic about the chance that we are winning this war and can continue to win it even as criminals start to adopt some of the, the methodologies that Robert and, and okay. Dave are both talking about. But I think you know, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing if we didn't see some really smart solutions emerging. Okay, Robert, does that convince you? Are you wrong? Mm, I'm op deep down, I'm optimistic yeah. you know, in the long term. But <clears throat> an interesting story is you know, that when the police ask a bank robber, why do you rob banks? He says, that's where the money is. It's the same with digital. You know, why does cyber, cyber crime happen? That's where the money is. We are moving, we have moved into a cyber world. That's where all the resources, the assets, the money is. So the, the incentive for criminal activity is huge. You know, and so you know, fighting that is just going to be an ongoing battle. Okay. Dave, are you, uh, you're, you're sort of hopelessly divided. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're getting better at responding to yesterday's problem. Um, but uh, our digital organizations are exploding in complexity. We are way past the point of human comprehension where you can get your head around everything that happens inside of an organization, how people work, what's happening with all those different systems and data. Yet we still ask, you know, hey, Bob, you're the head of security. Go and just find out everything that happens in Maersk and make sure it's secure. Hmm. That's All right. not really okay, I'm going to now ask the audience. Um, you can't say stalemate. And the reason why is that, <laughs> although it might be a stalemate, that's a little bit too much blurred in the center, a little bit more of the Gaussian distribution, too much of the mean. So <laughs> let's sharpen this, crystallize the issue. Are, you, are we winning or losing? All those who say, hey, all things considered, we're winning the war on this. Tensions being paid, products are being built, it's happening. Raise your hand if we're winning the war. Somebody said you were winning. Okay, that's <laughs> not a lot. That's like less sub 10%. Who here says losing the war? Oh my God, we're losing the war. <laughs> okay, who here is still on a Blackberry who's not voting? Like that guy over there. Okay, nudge him, winning or losing. All right, we're gonna go right into questions with the audience because you guys came here, you have a lot to think about and say and a lot to contribute as well. It doesn't have to be a question, it could also be an observation, but whether it's a question or an observation, it has to be short because we have 10 minutes. So go for it. Uh, we have a mic in the audience. Why don't we, I saw your hand first, then yours. Great. <coughs> Hi, my name is Patrick. I sit down, oh, um, it's recorded. Oh. Very short question to all of you. Uh, Europe is betting on explainable AI. How can you do explainable AI when you have such complex systems where things have to be automated eventually and the AI itself has to be autonomous? Great. Uh, the shimmer of explainable AI. Robert, you, you said we yeah. needed it. Um, I'm optimistic. I mean, interestingly, so if you look at the deep learning world we've, that we have now, that was a technique invented back in 1992-93, Jeff Hinton and co. Um, there were many of the AI algorithms being developed in the 1990s, evolutionary computing software agents that have great potential. And those ca the software agents in particular can be a much more transparent process. And I think we're going to see a resurgence of the whole software agent concept in AI, especially in security. It has an immense application for security. And inherently, that's a more transparent process. But um, his qu the underlying his question is the idea that if we know something works, offers better protection, but we can't explain why it works, why should we bother with explainability? We got the benefit of the improved performance. Yeah. I mean, I'll, tr trust me, I'll t if it works, I'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> And I'll worry about how explain it. it just, that's, a, that's a nice, just that it's easier to get the investment from your executives, your stakeholders, if you can give the explanation of why things are going on. Okay. There's a question right here. Okay. Uh, wait for the mic. Hi, thanks. <coughs> uh, the question is to you. you he's nice as well. <laughs> <laughs> of course. But uh, you mentioned that in probably five years, 
uh, it would be impossible to have a human in the loop. Um, it's something that scares me, uh, and I was wondering if you could expand on this and maybe explain uh, what the role of uh, cybersecurity experts uh, would be in that uh, in that scenario. Yeah, um, I think what we're beginning to see and what we're tra applying is the best world is a hybrid mix where you combine the best of the machine and the best of the human. And that, I think, will be the way forward. It's like the best chess systems are often combined hybrid hu human-machine players. Um, so human beings are still great at contextual knowledge, sort of social reasoning, the, the wider awareness. So the idea is to lift the floor of, you don't have your analysts doing the lower level stuff, you move them up to a higher level. So they're reasoning about the consequences and the sort of meta aspects of the problem and you have the machine increasingly automate everything else underneath. Um, I would do worry that you'll get to the point where even that's not possible in about that five year time frame where the AI is, is also doing sophisticated reasoning about your, your counteractions against it uh, and then you have to fully automate it and that'd be really interesting. Dave and Grace, let me come in, let you come in on this as well. Um, humans are in the loop, yes or no? Um, I agree with Robert, it has, I think they will, set a strategic tone or risk balance, but the, the machines will enforce it. So a human security person should say, I don't want unexpected data loss from the organization for any reason. If it's unexpected, stop it. But the myriad of ways that that will be enforced in your cloud, in your SaaS systems, on your laptops, mobile phones, that'll be AI reasoning and decision making and uh, will be essential to mitigate the speed of attacks that we saw on the slides. Yeah, I think this, the same applies also to um, humans. I think we'll still be determining the, the the risk management of the organization. What are the most important assets to you? Is it is it your physical assets? Is it something else? Is it your reputation? I think it's still going to be humans that that set that strategic vision. Right. But as you say, it's going to be enforced by machines increasingly. Great. Um, a, an observation which I, I can like to comment on. Rather than a technical issue, if we look at this as an economic issue, surely why we're winning is because we've woken up to the tolerable risk economically of what this means to us. Cyber's always been, at security, a Cinderella to service delivery, but surely that's no longer the case. Great. Let me do this. There's a lot of people who have their hands up, and I want to give everyone a chance to give like a 30-second question or intervention, and then ask the panel to summarize and choose one of those questions. So I see a woman back there, we'll start there, and then we'll work our way from the back of the room forward. Yeah, so the person right straight ahead to the left, to your left, <laughs> waving furiously. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so in the midterm, I think it looks quite clear that it will be a sort of mass identity fraud uh, for normal individuals. Might be positive in the long term. And I think that a lot of normal people still have some kind of illusion that police force will be able to, to help you out, which clearly isn't the case. So I'm wondering for all these people that will be exposed to these kind of things in the midterm, is that are we looking at a privatized law and order? And will the technology to help be um, democratized enough to support normal, sort of low, mid income people? Great question. There's a gentleman right behind you, right there. What do you think uh, quantum computing will introduce into cyber security and threats? Great, good question. Gentleman right there. Um, just like explosives and guns were essentially developed as technologies by governments or for governments, um, the majority of the tools, um, certainly that I'm aware of, are for um, hacking, theft, cyber criminality were developed by government organizations, um, whether in the West or, or not. Um, so as long as governments, I mean, how can we stop governments essentially developing the very tools that get put in the hands of criminals sure. um, which, which create these problems? Great. Gentleman right there. Oh, no, he's passed. Same question. And then there's a woman there. Hi, uh, you mentioned something about identity being very critical to security. Um, so yeah, I'm just really concerned about what happens if I lose control of my identity, how do I re-establish this? What are the, what's the technology? What are the companies that are working in this to secure so that I can take back my identity? How do I prove that I'm myself? Great, identity. Uh, there's a gentleman there, please. Hi there. Um, 
it strikes me that this is one of those areas in which um, data about what's happened in the past isn't that useful uh, to determine what you should do in the future. Um, so attack vectors that have kind of previously been used don't necessarily uh, give you an idea of what might happen uh, in, the, in the future. So somebody mentioned using password managers. It strikes me that using password managers is uh, a good idea until it isn't. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if you comment on that. Okay, at this point I'm gonna open it, give it back to the panelists unless someone has a really urgent question that we've not raised that we should all have on our radar screen. Nope, great. So Grace, why don't we start with you? Uh, if you can choose one of the questions, this is a yeah. summation, you've got basically 60 yeah. seconds. Yeah. Uh, you can ignore all the questions and simply <laughs> it, but please. So I think the, the lady's question was around, um, uh, remind uh, me, it was privatization, uh, privatization yeah, yeah. And um, I think it's a really interesting observation, interesting challenge. Um, I think as we see more and more individuals and businesses migrating all of their data and assets to the cloud, Increasingly, we're going to see a small number of cloud providers essentially becoming your personal security force. So if you have asked AWS or G Google or whoever to manage your data, you are essentially putting your uh, trust in them to preserve your identity, your personal assets and data, whether you're an individual or a company. I think that's a very, very interesting um, thing for us all to think about. Uh, I think it does present um, some some ethical challenges. I think it, it, it sort of links in a sense to, to your question around your, your identity, which I think you're right to be concerned about that. Um, the, we see in other areas of technology this great trend towards sharing and you know, not owning assets anymore, you know, car sharing, home sharing and so forth. And increasingly people thinking you don't necessarily need to own physical assets in the same way. My hope is that the counter to that is around your personal data where people start to feel more concerned about owning and controlling their personal data and assets. And quite how that fits with this migration to large cloud providers owning a lot of it, I think is, there's gonna be some tension there, but I think people do need to start to think about this, um, this need to not have an assumption of sharing your personal data. Great, thanks. Robert, let me ask you, in 60 seconds, can you choose yeah. one um, lasting? I'll go a different direction entirely. Sure. Yeah. Um, well, it's kind of related to one of the first questions. It's, this is a collective problem, and it's about establishing new norms. Uh, some, a comparison that's sometimes made, it's like sort of piracy in the 16th, 17th centuries, where nation states were not cooperating, and piracy was a legitimate state activity. Right now, we have a few states, uh, you know, sort of specific states, that are not being responsible, that are tolerating you know, you know, large-scale commercial cyber hacking groups in, in their territory, and they know about it. So, you know, there's a, a kind of this question of putting pressure on those states at the sort of international level all the way down until we create a new social norm. And like Paris, you know, with states, and you say, we've, we can do it. It's like airline travel, you know, postal systems. We've done this in the past. We've established new norms of international cooperation. And you know, when you post a letter, you expect it to get there, and it typically does. You know, these were international norms established in the sort of big 19th century. So we can establish better norms by which we would cooperate and not tolerate you know, states harboring such activity. Right. Dave? Uh, I agree, but I'll go a step bolder. Um, every government in the world is involved in hacking. We, um, whether it's you know, perceived over here in the Western world as good hacking or bad hacking, they are all doing it. Um, law enforcement can't make any progress until there is international cooperation. The only way to investigate and bring people to justice is by having the diplomatic supporting uh, mechanisms to allow you to bring other people around the world to, to jail. And to the gentleman's point right at the start, the governments around the world, while the internet has yet to grown up, feel that it is a reasonable economic burden on citizens and corporations to allow the basic attack fest that goes on from nation to nation and nations against citizens. And until that changes, it's just going to be a technical battle and, and many of the measures that, that Grace was telling us about. Great. Let me, uh, there's no way to sum up what we heard on the panel, but if there's one lasting thought, it might be this. There's probably two kinds of problems in the world, some problems that you solve and other problems that you manage and you actually never solve, and clearly cybersecurity fits into that latter category. Please join me in thanking the panel. Thank you.